All right. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 is commonly known as the, the charity chapter. And that's what the subject of the sermon is going to be about tonight. It's going to be about charity. And 1 Corinthians 13, we're kind of going through this. It's going to be similar more to a Bible study just because there's so much information packed in here on charity. I've got some other references we're going to go to where the Bible talks about charity. But this is an important aspect of our Christian life. If you've noticed some of the language used, we're going to go back over this, about how important it is to have charity. Now, it's important to note that charity is not something that you do necessarily. It's something that you have. In today's society, you know, when people talk about charity, you think about giving to an organization and say that's charity. And that's kind of where people's definition of charity stops. And as we've seen from this chapter and as we're going to go through, charity is much, much deeper and much more than just giving some money to an organization. Um, the, the, com the popular thing that's been going around recently is the Ice Bucket Challenge on Facebook. If you've seen that or if you're familiar with that, where people are taking this ice bucket and they're dumping it over their head and, and donating some money to, to, to research ALS, um, which is a horrible disease. But, you know, people look at that and they say that, oh, well, that's charity. And I'm not saying that it's, it's not, but charity is way, 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 way more than just giving money to an organization. Let's take a look at this. We're going to really dig into what the Bible is talking about charity because this is something that we need to have in our Christian lives. Oftentimes this gets overlooked about, and, and what charity is essentially, it's, it's a love. It's a type of love. Okay, having charity in your heart is, is, having, is having a love. And it's something that you need to have as part, as part of um, your being as a Christian. Let's look down here at verse number one. He says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Now, Paul was blessed. He had, he had a gift of tongues. He was able to speak to people of other nations and be able to communicate with them in their language. It was a great miracle. It was a great blessing that God poured out on the apostles at this time to be able to, to preach the gospel to every creature where they were able to, to speak and use all these different languages and, um, and be able to preach the word of God that way. And he says, even if I speak with the, with the language of angels, even in the tongue of angels, he says, if I have not charity, even though that's a great thing, you, people could look at you like, wow, what a great man of God. He's got this great gift of God. He says, if I don't have charity, I'm just become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. He's like, the noise that I make, it's, it's, it's just kind of meaningless, is what he's saying there. If I don't have charity with these great gifts, it's just sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. Look at verse number two. He says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. He's saying, you know, I have this gift of prophecy. God has revealed his word unto me. I'm preaching his word. I understand these mysteries, these great truths of the Bible. I have this great knowledge from God. And I have all this faith so that I could even remove mountains. We are talking about that this morning, just having the, the faith as a grain of mustard seed able to, remo to move a mountain. He says, even though I could have all of this great stuff, these great gifts, and, and people will look at you again like you're, so, you're a great man of God, and Apostle Paul was. He says, even though I might have all of these things, if I don't have charity, I'm nothing. And let that sink in. He says, I'm nothing. If I don't have charity, I'm nothing with it. With all these other things, all these other gifts, everything else I could have, if I don't have charity, I'm nothing. And that charity is that love in your heart. And, and, it's, and it's a love that, that you're going to go out and, and do good unto others, essentially. But we're, we're, we'll get into that just real soon. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Verse number three says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. And see, this is the common definition. This is what people will say, oh, well, you know, you've given charity, you've, you've just given money to help people out, you've given money to a cause or to a do do donation. He's saying that's not even charity. He says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. So he's saying it's possible to give money and still not have charity. Charity is something we need to have in our hearts. Charity is something where you care about other people and you love other people and, and your motivation is to help them. And all of these other things are tools 
to help those people. These are all instruments to use the, the, the prophecies and understanding the knowledge and, and bestowing goods and giving your body to be burned. Hey, that all ought to come from a charitable heart, not just um, not for any other reasons, basically. Verse number four, we start seeing these attributes of charity. The Bible says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. These are all attributes of charity. Now, all of these attributes are coming from an attitude that esteems others better than yourself is, is, is the type of attitude that, chari that, that charitable attitude has. It's a humble attitude. It's one where you don't think highly of yourselves. You're thinking more on other people with true love in your heart for others. And let's look at each of these attributes again real closely. It says, charity suffereth long. It means it's, it, you know, if you have charity... You're not going to be easily provoked. You're not going to be easily angered. You're long suffering. When people do you wrong, when people you know, treat you bad, you can suffer that. You can allow that without just flying off the handle again, angry and, and seeking revenge. It, charity suffereth long, it says, and is kind. No reason to be mean. You know, if you're a Christian, you ought not to be mean to other people. If you have charity in your hearts, we ought to be kind. And what happens oftentimes is that... Um, People have a tendency to, to, to really study the Bible and learn and, and just feel like, man, I have all this knowledge. The Bible says that knowledge puffeth up, puffeth up but charity edifieth. People have a tendency to get, to get really mean because they think that they, they know so much of the Bible and that everyone else they talk to is just an idiot. And, oh, you don't know this and you don't know that. And they don't have the kindness in their heart. The Bible says that charity is kind. And we, we need to know how to, how to deal with people. And look, maybe, some, maybe people you talk to don't have as much knowledge as you, but don't let that wisdom puff up your mind into thinking that somehow you're better than them because you have this knowledge, because you're not. We're not better than anyone else. What you ought to be doing is using that knowledge with charity in your heart. Because, I mean, Paul says, look, I have all knowledge, all mystery. I have the gift of prophecy, but it profits me nothing if I don't have charity. It's no good. It's useless. All the knowledge that you have, if you don't have that charity in your heart to go out and to reach people, it's going to profit nothing. Verse 4, right in the middle there, it says, Charity envieth not. So you're not concerned about what other people have and, and either greedy or just looking on other people and just wishing you had something that they have that you don't already have. Charity doesn't, the charity doesn't have that type of an attitude. You're not looking at what other people have. You're... you're you're not looking at it and wanting it for yourself. You're looking at how can you help them do better. Charity vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. Again, it's, it's not proud. It's not having a proud attitude being lifted up, lifting up yourself above everybody else. Verse 5, doth not behave itself unseemly. Um, obviously, living accordingly and, and if you have charity in your heart, you're not going to be doing things that are unseemly, living in lots of sin. It says, seeketh not her own. So again, the same type of an attitude. It's the, it's the attitude where you're not looking after yourself. You're looking at the, the things of other people. You're not seeking things for yourself. It's not easily provoked and thinketh no evil. All these things. These, these are the attributes of charity that the Bible is describing here that we need to try to make sure that we can incorporate into our life. Now, there's a lot of attributes here, but they all, again, they stem to that main attitude of, of putting others and esteeming others better than yourself. Keeping a humil humble mind and, and one that wants to serve and wants to help other people. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 6 says, Rejoiceth not in iniquity. So there's no pleasure in sin. And again, a lot of Christians these days have a tendency to, to, to rejoice in iniquity and, and they don't even necessarily think about it. When you're thinking about, you know, what, how do you get your entertainment? Does your entertainment come from sitting in front of a, of a television screen and there's people on the screen committing all kinds of iniquity and blaspheming God and you, know, you have fornication, you've got adultery. Are you rejoicing in that iniquity? Do you use that, that as your entertainment and that's what you want to do with your time is put a bunch of sin in front of your eyes in front of the, from the television screen? That's not having a charitable heart. He says, rejoiceth not in iniquity. 
shouldn't be happy and, and take pleasure in the sins of others. It says, but rejoiceth in the truth. If you're interested in hearing the truth, I want to know the truth from God's Word. This is what makes us happy. This is where, our, where we get our, spend our time with, and this is what we're going to get um, our truth from, rejoicing in the truth. Verse 7 says, Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. It's very, excuse me, um, attitude trusting in the Bible, believing everything in the Bible, and enduring through whatever might come your way. The Bible says in verse 8, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. All those other things that, that we had just read about earlier in the beginning of this chapter, it says those things can come and go, but charity never fails. That love, that, 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 that love of your heart should never fail, never goes away. It says, For we know in part we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And on and on. Now, um, and the Bible says at the end there, verse 13, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. We can see from what we've read here how important being, having charity is. It says, Out of faith, hope, and charity, charity is the greatest. And we also saw how you, know, you could have all these other spiritual gifts. You can prophesy. You could you have faith that could move mountains. But if you don't have charity, it's nothing. This is critical in our Christian lives. It's something we need to, to make sure that we have in our being. We have in our heart that, that we're not just too focused with ourselves. And we're not just too focused on, on even just attaining these things. We've got to make sure we have this, this charitable heart that will lead us um, in, in dealing with things properly. Turn if you would. We're in 1 Corinthians 13. Just flip back to chapter number 8. And I had already quoted this earlier, but this is where it, count, where it comes from. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 1. It says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. See, what he's talking about with things offered unto idols, he had mentioned that, you know, we know that it's just food, you know, the stuff that's offered unto idols. Now, you shouldn't do it because it's a sin, but he says, we know that's food. We have knowledge. We know that that idol's not a real God. We know it's just, it's just, you know, wood and metal and whatever. It's, it's just the creation of man's hands. It has no real power. And he says that knowledge can puff you up, but charity edifieth. And what does it mean to edify someone? When you think of an edifice or edifying is, is basically it's you're building it up. If a building has an edifice, it's, it's, it's built up. When you, when you edify someone, you're building them up. And charity is all about helping others and strengthening them and building them up. That's the charity that we ought to have. See, you could be puffed up with knowledge, but it's going to be useless unless you have that charity to help other people out. What good is a knowledge? And I like to use this oftentimes. You know, we go out and we preach the gospel and we knock on people's doors and we try to witness about Jesus Christ and his love for them. It's one thing, you know, for you, Christian, to be saved and to sit at home and you can have your knowledge and you could be saved and you could know, hey, Jesus Christ died for my sins and I'm going to heaven when I die. Hey, that's great. But what good is that knowledge of salvation going to do for anybody else if you don't go out and share that same message with others? They're still going to die and go to hell if you just decide to sit at home and not do anything about it. That's why we need to have this charity that's going to go out and preach the gospel to love people enough to bring the word of God to them and say, look, Jesus Christ died for your sins. You don't have to go to hell. That is going to build them up. That is going to help them. And if we're going to have charity in our lives, we need to make sure that we're focusing on the loss of this world and that we're, that we're going to go out and do the work that's set before us instead of just sitting at home, just reading our Bible and having our own knowledge and not doing anything with it. We're in 1 Corinthians 8. Just flip back over to, um, to, to chapter 16. We're not looking at quite all of the references of charity, but we're looking at quite a few of them. 1 Corinthians 16 the Bible says in verse 13, Watch ye, 
Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. Again, just showing the importance. Everything that we do needs to be done with charity. Focus on other people. That's exactly what Jesus Christ's attitude was when he came here. He came here with an attitude to serve. He came to minister, not to be ministered unto, but to help others, to seek and save those that are lost. That was his mission. That was his job here was to go out and do things for everybody else. He even got to the point where he got on his hands and his knees and he, he washed his disciples' feet. He ministered unto them. He was always ministering unto other people. He came. He had a lot of work to do. He had a hard job. But he did it. And he did it out of a loving heart, out of a charitable heart. Let's turn to um, Colossians chapter 3. Just a little bit f uh, far uh, to the right in your Bible. <clears throat> We're in 1 Corinthians. We've got 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. And then Colossians. Colossians chapter number 3. And we're going to read in verse number 12. The Bible says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Get this, because this is these are all attributes of, of having a charitable heart. Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. You want to grow to the next level in your Christian life? Hey, the, it says the bond of perfectness, completeness, is having that charity. Above all of these things, have charity. Now again, these are all attributes of having a charitable heart, being merciful and kind and forgiving one another. When someone does you wrong, not holding that against them, but having the love to look past that the same way that Christ has looked past your sins when you received Him as your Savior. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Please turn there if you would. It's going to be a shorter sermon tonight, but we'll look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. It's important. There's, the, the Bible can't, you know, we, we see over and over again in these chapters, with chari in these scriptures with charity, the importance of it. You know, in 1 Corinthians 13, the greatest of these is charity. In Colossians 3, what we just saw, it's the bond of perfectness. 1 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse number 5. The Bible says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. So the end of the commandments, it's, it's you know, the obeying the commandments of God, the end of that, the goal of that, the result of that is charity out of a pure heart. That's the purpose. It says that's the end of the commandment and of a good conscience of faith unfeigned. It says from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. And again, you know, we believe in, in total the, the grace of God that will forgive us of our sins because salvation is not of works lest any man should boast. It's, it's given to us freely. But at the same time, we don't think that you ought to just go out and start living a reckless life and of abandon and sin because, hey, we're under grace. No, the, the Bible has... God has given us these commandments for a reason. We ought to follow His commandments and we strive to follow as closely as possible. And the Bible is saying here, look, the end of the commandment, if we're, if we're able to, you know, to, to try to live as closely as, as God wants us to as possible, it's charity out of a pure heart. We're going we're gonna to get this understanding and realize that God's commandments and His rules for us for, are for our benefit. They're not to hurt us. They're, they're not to, to restrict us and, to, and to, to, to keep us down. On the contrary, His commandments are for our benefit. And when we start, and the closer we can get ourselves to, to be in line with God's commandments, we'll start to realize that and hopefully be able to get charity out of a pure heart. And it says, of a good conscience and faith of faint. But a lot of people desire to be teachers of the law that have no understanding about the law. They say that understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. There's a lot of people that want to teach the law and they'll teach salvation by the law. 
And they have no idea what they're talking about. Because salvation comes as a, as a gift that's free from God. But let's keep reading here in 1 Timothy 1. Look at verse number 9. It says, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was commit, committed to my trust. When you sin, when you break God's commandments, you're always influencing somebody else. We like to think that, oh no, this is just my personal sin. Wrong. Anytime you commit a sin, it's always going to have a negative impact or negative influence on somebody else. Like, for example, me, I'm married. I can't just decide to go out and, and you know, go out and get drunk. That's going to have an impact on my children. It's going to have a negative impact on my wife. I might not think it's doing anything wrong, but guess who's going to be looking up to me and learning from my ways? It's going to be my kids, or not just my kids. It could be other people. It could be friends, anybody. The sins that you commit, you might think that it's not affecting anybody else, but I guarantee you it is. Sin always has the result of impacting more people than just yourself. It always does that. And that's not being very charitable if you're, not, if you're disobeying and getting into sin with God's law. And that's why I believe the Bible is saying here that the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. That's what we get as a result by following that. Let's turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter number 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Let's keep on going to the right in your Bible. It's getting closer to the end. 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at verse number 7 of 1 Peter 4. The Bible reads, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging, as every man hath received the gift. Even so, minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. So again, above all things, have fervent charity. You see the importance that's, that's being placed on this in Scripture of having charity. Having fervent charity. That's a fiery, fervent charity in your hearts. It says, among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. 2 Peter chapter 1. Next book over, 2 Peter. Look at verse number 5. 2 Peter 1 says, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make, you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we kind of see a progression here in 2 Peter chapter 1. He says, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. So you start off getting saved by having faith in Jesus Christ. That's what gets you saved. You add to that virtue. What's virtue? It's doing good. It's, it's doing right by the law, doing right by God. You're adding to that faith that you, you got saved. Okay, what are you going to do now? Well, now I'm going to start adding to that faith by, by doing things that are right. And when I start obeying and listening to God, I'm going to add to that virtue knowledge. I'm going to understand a lot more of God's Word. I'm going to read and dig into God's Word. And to knowledge, I'm going to add temperance. Temperance is control of yourself, control of your temper, control of your emotions, control of the things that you do. You're going to be able to... to you know, as you start adding to your faith, virtue, you're learning more, now you're going to be able to control yourself better and do what's right in each appropriate situation. And then to temperance, you're going to add patience. Obviously, being able to keep yourself under control is going to require some patience. You're going to have to be able to deal with things, deal with other people, be long-suffering and able to, 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 to handle things that are coming your way that, you know, that aren't necessarily pleasant to deal with or, or people who are giving you a hard time about things. Hey, you have the patience. And then to patience, you add godliness. 
right? Godliness is, again, just, just getting more holy, getting more sanctified by, by obeying God and, and, and living righteously through His Word. We're going to add to all of that godliness. And then it says to godliness, brotherly kindness, where, okay, up to this point, you've kind of gotten yourself situated, so to speak. You're, you're, you, you've worked on a lot of things in your own life. You've worked on your own knowledge and your own temperance and your own patience and your own godliness. Well, add to that brotherly kindness now where you're going out and helping other people out. You've gotten yourself to a point, at least to a, you know, where, where you're starting to get on the right track. Hey, we need, to, we need to look out for other people and add brotherly kindness. And then finally, add to brotherly kindness, charity. That's the end. That's the last step is adding that to charity. Now, this is something I believe we should con continually be working on throughout our lives is adding all of these things, all these good attributes in our Christian life. But notice that the last thing of, of perfection there is charity. Having that charitable heart where you're just, you get completely focused on helping other people out. And, it, and the Bible promises us here in verse 8, for if these things be in you, if you have these attributes, if you work on these, if you get these in your life, if these are in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, you will be fruitful. You will bring forth. You will be seeing people get saved. You will be having the power of God in your life. If you have all of these things in your life, God's going to use you and you will not be unfruitful. Let's flip back, if you would, to Romans 14. This will be the last, the last scripture that we turn to tonight. Romans 14. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time in here. Romans 14, we're pretty much, we go through the whole chapter. Let's start in verse number one. The Bible says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgeth, judgeth another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Now I'm going to pause right here and just explain what's going on. The Bible's talking about people, some people are more weak in the faith than others. You might have a certain knowledge, you might have a certain understanding. And in here they use this example of, of eating food, of our diet. What do we eat? He says, one man believeth that he may eat all things, which is true according to the Bible. In the New Testament, the dietary restrictions have been lifted. We're no longer under that old covenant restricting what we can and can't eat. God's given all things for us to be able to eat. But then it says, another who is weak eateth herbs. So now you've got someone else who believes, well, no, we should only be eating vegetables. You're a vegetarian. Okay. Now, According to the Bible, according to Scripture right here, he said, one believeth that, it, that he may eat all things, and another who is weak eateth herbs. So he's, he's explaining that the weak Christian, the one who doesn't have as much knowledge, is the one who thinks that they only should eat the, the vegetables, the vegetarian. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, if someone wants to be a vegetarian, fine. And if they think that, you know, well, we shouldn't be eating these things from the Bible, fine. Okay, he says, he that is weak in the faith, receive ye but not to doubtful disputations. He's saying, receive that person. That's fine. It's not a big deal. If that's what they think, no big deal. You have the truth. You understand. You, you know that you can eat all things, but you don't need to make a big issue out of it, make a big stink out of it, and just have to prove them wrong. It says, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. So the person who knows, hey man, I could eat any of these things, you shouldn't look at that other person as a vegetarian and despise that person in your heart. And on the, on the other way, too, he says, And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, because he'd be judging unrighteously. He'd be looking at that person saying, Oh, well, I can't believe you're eating pork or, or eating shrimp or something like that. Look, we can eat all things. You don't need to be judging what I'm eating. And, and we ought not to be despising those who think that we shouldn't be eating that stuff. It's fine. Just, just 
You know, it's not a big deal. That's what it says in verse 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. He's saying, let God deal with it. Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. And then we continue on here, and it's talking about days now instead of diet. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Again, okay, some people like to worship and, and, and go to church on Sundays. Some people do it on Saturdays. You know, whatever. You get esteem, esteem one day above another, or they're all the same. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Again, this isn't something that's a direct commandment or a law given by God that, that someone's in sin. If they say, oh, well, no, we have to meet on Sunday or no, we have to meet on Wednesday or no, we have to, whatever day it is. There's no commandment in the Bible that says you must meet on this day. So be persuaded in your own mind. If you, if you want to esteem, hey, if you want to set aside a day for the Lord, amen, great, no problem. But don't look down upon those who don't do the same thing. And if, you know, someone who, who just says, no, I treat every day equally. I want to serve God with all, all of my days. Amen. Good. Don't look down on the guy that wants to dedicate an entire day for serving God. It's, you know, either way, it's, it's fine. Be persuaded in your own mind. That's what he's saying here. Verse number six says, he that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And this actually kind of falls into with the gossiping busybody sermon that I, that I preached on last week. You know, we're all going to be accountable unto God. These little issues about esteeming one day better than another or what diet a person eats, look, we're going to stand before God for our own stuff. Mind your own business, essentially, is what he's saying. Just let it go. It's no big deal. Verse 13 says, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. And this is what I really want to focus on in this chapter. We had to go through the rest of this to get the context of what he's talking about. You know, it's eating and, and, and days one over another. He's basically kind of saying it's not that big of a deal. But here's where we're going to see the charity out of all of this. Here's where we're going to see where a person can have knowledge. And you can understand that something, you know, it's not a big deal. But even, you know, this person that's a vegetarian man is like, man, he keeps saying we can't eat this stuff. This is where the charity is going to come in for the person who has knowledge. Okay, let's keep reading here. It says in verse 13, we'll read it again. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. So he's saying here, look, he says, I know that there is nothing unclean of itself. And he's referring to the food. He's, he's going back to referring to the diet, right? Because in the Old Testament, God made a clear separation. These animals are unclean and these animals are clean. You can eat these animals because they're clean. You cannot eat these other ones. They're unclean to you. But it was lifted in the New Testament. So he's explaining here, look, if someone still is thinking, you know, that this food is unclean, you don't need to rub it in their face and just invite them over for dinner and be like, come on over. We're going to have you over for dinner and just, okay, here's what we're having. We're having pork and you're just... 
cutting up this meat that they think is unclean. You know, you're putting a stumbling block in their way. Why do you need to offend that person? You're not going to do them any good by just rubbing things in their face and just, just bringing it up. That is not a charitable attitude to have. Look, if that's going to cause them to fall, because he also adds this. He says, um, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So that person that might think, hey, we shouldn't be eating pork because it's unclean. Because they have that belief in their, in their heart, if they were to then go ahead and do it, if they were to go ahead and eat, eat pork, to them it is sin. Because what they're doing then is they're, they're not trusting what they believe as far as, um, you know, they're not obeying what they think is God's commandments. So even if, it's, even if it is okay, because they think it's wrong and breaking the law, if they were to go and do that stuff, breaking God's law, then it is sin to them. And, and by making them sin, you're, you're not being charitable at all. You're having, you're having a, more of an evil heart against your brother in Christ than having a loving, good attitude towards your brother in Christ. And, and that's how we all live. Look, just because you know something is true and something is fine, and, but if you know someone else has a, has a different opinion about that, and we're not talking about you know, adultery and someone just saying, well, I think it's just fine. Look, no, it's not. <laughs> okay, these are commandments. Those are clear based out of Scripture. But some of these other things, you know, the dietary things, the days, whatever, it's not that big of a deal. It's not made a big deal, especially in the New Testament where, you know, those things are lifted. But if someone wants to still obey that stuff and hear those things, okay, whatever. But we don't need to be using our knowledge of puffing ourselves up instead of being charitable towards that person and just let it go. You know, we want to invite that person over for dinner. You know what? We're going to have salad. We're going to have this food, you know, and, and cater to them and not offend them because there's no reason for it at all. You're, only gonna, you're not going to be edifying them in, what, in any way whatsoever. And, you know, ultimately, hopefully they'll just be able to learn and grow stronger in the Lord. But look, everybody is at a different stage in their Christian growth. Nobody starts off overnight, you get saved, and all of a sudden you just know everything about the Bible. I know I've had different beliefs that, I, that have changed over time as I've learned and, and known more about God's words. Like, oh, I was wrong about that. Now I see this is what's true. Everybody goes through that. So there's no reason to be either holding that over their head or really just kind of rubbing their face. And if they believe a certain way over uh, an issue like this, fine. Just let it be. That is what having a charitable attitude is, is, is like. The Bible says, um, let's just keep reading. We'll finish up this story. We're almost done. Let not your good be evil spoken of. Verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. So even though we have that knowledge, look, if, if, if eating this or drinking that is going to cause your brother to stumble, or if it's going to make them offended, or if it's going to make them weak, he says, don't do it. Okay? Keep that person in mind. Think, think about that person. Love that person enough to, to just not, not be a stumbling block to them. <clears throat> Another word for charity is love. I think I mentioned that at the beginning of the sermon. And there's multiple ways a person can love. There's lots of different ways. You know, there's a love between a husband and a wife, a love between a father and a son, a love between friends. You know, there's different ways. And charity is just is, is a specific type of love that we can have in our hearts. And I believe it's it could be wrapped up in this. You don't have to turn there, but in John 15, 12, Jesus Christ said, This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Jesus gave us the best example of being charitable, of having charity in his heart, of really caring about the needs of others and, and really just, just focused on what is going to do the best for them. 
He says that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That is the, the ultimate thing that a person can do is, is to give up your own life and, and to, to give up yourself. It's a selfless type of love. One that says, even if it means costing me my very life, which your life should be dear to you. I know my life is dear to me. I don't want to lose my life. But when you're focused and thinking about somebody else to the point to where you're willing to say, you know what? Because I love them so much and I want them to succeed and I'm esteeming them better than myself, I'm willing to give my life for them. If that's what it comes down to, if that's what it means to help you out, I'm going to give my life for you. And that's the love that Jesus Christ had because that's exactly what he did. He gave his life as the, as the sacrifice, as the atonement for our sins. We didn't deserve that. And you know what? There's going to be people in your life, they don't deserve, so to speak, they don't deserve your love. Maybe they treat you poorly. Maybe they're your enemies. The Bible says to love your enemies. Look, if you're going to have that charitable heart, then we're going to need to be able to be long-suffering and look past other people's sins, whether it be sins in their own life or sins against us, and be able to love that person to want to help them in the best way possible, whatever is going to, going to not be a stumbling block for them, but, but to, to actually help them. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for this great... Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 on charity, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just help us to understand this, understand the importance of it and how much you've emphasized in your word how important it is for us as Christians to have charity. Lord, I pray that you would please just, just move us to, to grow in charity and in love of other people, dear Lord, to, to preach the gospel to them. To understand that if, that if we don't give people the gospel, maybe they, maybe they won't have an opportunity to even hear it. Lord, help us to have that burden on our heart to be focused on other people and to, um, to be able to, out of love, preach your word. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.